Welcome to One Dime Radio. This will be a very, very special installment featuring The Marxist Project, one of my favorite YouTube channels, one of my favorite Marxist YouTube channels that delivers a very balanced and critical analysis of Marxist theory, as well as videos that document a socialist history. For instance, I would highly recommend their video, How Freedom Came to Russia, satirically titled, of course, about the consequences of the fall of the Soviet Union and its aftermath. I would highly recommend watching that if you are new to the Marxist project and checking out the rest of their content if you want to learn a bit about Marxist theory. But today, we're going to be talking about probably the most debated topic among the communist left, and that is the Soviet Union. The downfall of the Soviet Union can be characterized and oversimplified by a variety of one-dimensional narratives. For example, you have the conservative narrative of the evil empire, but more popular on in the narrative when it comes to Soviet history is the liberal narrative that communism was good in theory, but failed in practice. It was a failed utopia. Among the left, though, it gets a lot more complex. On the left, you have the anarchists, the left communists, social democrats, Marxist-Leninists, the Maoists, the split between the revisionists and the anti-revisionists, all of which have competing narratives, some with a lot of truth, many of which I would argue actually all of these narratives can be one-dimensional in scope and blur out certain realities. For instance, the anarchist narrative, which is that the problem was seizing state power, that the USSR ended up being state capitalist and the problem started with Lenin, the vanguard party, authoritarianism, and Stalin was merely a consequence of that. That's one narrative you hear from the likes of Noam Chomsky, for example. As well as you have, probably on the other end, the so-called anti-revisionist marxist leninist narrative, which, to simplify, often tends to posit that it was all going fine until Khrushchev and de-Stalinization and the revisionist departure of Marxist doctrine, so to speak. It's oversimplifying a bit, but we'll get into that. And this is the type of conversation you don't find in very many leftist podcasts or YouTube channels who will either one-sidedly adopt one of these one-dimensional narratives or come up with a very easy scapegoat, such as the USSR was state capitalist, the USSR was socialist, but ruined by revisionism. The USSR could have been this if Trotsky taken power, et cetera, et cetera. All narratives often geared towards simply evading the question altogether, which is not what we should be doing as leftists. We should be grappling with the reality that is the first worker state ever attempted, the Soviet experiment. So without further ado, I figure that we can start by the different eras of Soviet history in chronological order, starting with after the revolution, the civil war, and we'll go from the different administrations like Lenin, Stalin, Khrushchev, Brezhnev, and of course, everyone's least favorite, Gorbachev. But before getting into it, if you enjoy this type of content, feel free to support the channel and podcast One Dime Radio on Patreon slash One Dime. And before getting straight into the history, Let's give a brief introduction to the Marxist project. Yeah, uh, well, let me let me backtrack a little and just say uh, uh, I'm happy to be here to talk about, as you said, this very important and often rehashed conversation. Uh, I think that you're exactly right that there is a lot of one dimensionality when we talk about these things as leftists. So I'm really excited to uh, parse out the details and try and uh, contextualize as much as possible the different eras and the different elements that were at play throughout Soviet history. Uh, and also, I want to say I, I am myself a big fan of your channel. Uh, so to any of the viewers of my channel, I highly recommend One Dime. I um really enjoyed recently the videos on monetary theory. They really had me thinking a lot and helped me connect some ideas that I was working through. So thank you for having me here. I'm really excited to talk about this stuff. Um, and as far as my channel goes, I really am only in one space, uh, just YouTube and the channel there, uh, The Marxist Project. 
I have a Twitter account, but don't really use it much to some people's chagrin, but I refuse to. Probably for your good, for your mental health. For my, for my (laughs) mental health and just, yeah. (laughs) So it's, it's there. I occasionally do stuff on Twitter, but mostly uh, I upload on YouTube with increasing uh, scarcity, unfortunately at this time, but uh, yeah. I got introduced to your channel with the video, How Freedom Came to Russia, uh, mm. which is just an excellent clickbait title, by the way, because oh, you know, to, attract, to attract the anti-communists, you might click on it and yes. think, oh, yay, look, look how uh, Yeltsin and Gorbachev's, ref- how Yeltsin's reforms <laughs> saved Russia. And you click and you just see what happened. And I think it's a brilliant introduction to this because I think if one is a leftist or if one just cares about the well-being of people, you know, who uh, is a working class person or sympathetic to working class causes at the very least, one really can't watch that video and come out with the assumption that, you know, the shock therapy economic liberalization after the fall of the Soviet Union was a good thing. Um, I don't think anyone can see, I don't think anyone can agree that that was good. And uh, your video does an excellent uh, job at really highlighting just the insane depravity unleashed on the Russian people with, you know, the decline of living standards, increasing suicide rates, the increase of the, uh, the black market, uh, and illegal, uh, economy and whatnot. And I think as leftists, we should think that we should recognize that two things can be true. The Soviet union at the end of the day failed. This is undeniable. Whether it, why it failed is open to discussion, which we're here to do. But we can also acknowledge the other reality, which is that the fall of the Soviet Union was objectively bad for worker movements across the world. This might seem obvious to some, but for some, it's not. You've had leftists in the past who have said why the fall of the Soviet Union was a triumph for socialism, a triumph for Marxism. You know, people like Noam Chomsky have said this. Even some other Marxists have said this. What's your opinion on the take of the fall of the Soviet Union and its consequences? Yeah, I I, I really agree about, um, I think that you don't have to be a Marxist or a socialist to uh, recognize, identify the collapse of the Soviet Union as, you know, a humanitarian catastrophe on a large scale that rippled out beyond the, the actual boundaries of the Soviet Union. Um, obviously, what happened within each of the republics was pretty um, unfathomable, I think. And I think that a lot of the people who make this claim that this was some great victory for X or Y reason simply were too far removed from what was really happening. Like they're not fully aware of just how devastating the immediate aftermath was for the collapse. But even if you don't, you know, even if you're not privy to the experience that people had coming out of the Soviet Union in the post-Soviet sphere and like the shock therapy and the level of social immiseration, um, the effect that the, the end of the Soviet Union had geopolitically is also understated. The Soviet Union for better or for worse existed as a buffer to Western hegemony and um, the United States essentially got a blank check after the Soviet Union collapsed to do essentially whatever it wanted in 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 the Middle East, for example, and in other parts of the world. It, it uh, I don't think that the foreign policy of the United States in the 90s and early 2000s would have been possible if the Soviet Union was still around and was still a superpower in some respect. So the effect of the collapse not only hurt the lives of people in the Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union, but it definitely also uh, threw millions of other people in other parts of the world into extremely precarious, fatal, dangerous situations. I mean, that's one of the biggest impacts for sure is is foreign policy and just the realm of geopolitics going from a multipolar world to a unipolar world. Obviously, as we can see now with uh, with <laughs> with uh, Putin's Russia now and uh, the rise of China, that's obviously changing back into a multipolar world. But I think you're absolutely right that 
in the type of foreign policy you saw in the 90s, such as the intervention in Yugoslavia, uh, the war in Iraq, well, both wars in Iraq, really, but especially the second one, yeah. and, um, and the war in Afghanistan probably wouldn't have been possible uh, with the Soviet Union around. And I mean, people can debate as to like what were Soviet interests abroad and whatnot, mm. but there are for sure, they did act as this buffer state. And I think what's also another important thing is they really put pressure on Western countries economically. And I think that's another thing that's understated because, you know, while people can debate whether they're actually socialists or not state capitalists or whatever, there is a correlation, I think, and I would like curious to hear your thoughts on this, is to the correlation between the welfare state and the fall of the Soviet Union, the welfare state globally, because Mm. after the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, you started to see a huge decline in social democracy that arguably started before, but especially in countries, especially in Western Europe, uh, like France, Spain, Portugal, and the Nordic countries as well, like uh, Denmark, Sweden, uh, and Finland, is you saw a decline of the a very big underfunding of the welfare welfare state things like two tiered healthcare a decline of unions suppression of unions after the soviet union uh, do you think these things are related or is this just a coincidence that maybe you know the fall of the soviet union there was a popularization popularization of neoliberal ideas or because they had nothing to compare themselves to the the capitalist mm-hmm. states yeah i i mean so i think it's the the issue of causality there is kind of it's kind of uh bi-directional in the sense that like you said what was happening in the 80s and 90s even prior to the collapse of the soviet union was this wave of neoliberalism that gripped the uk and the us and then subsequently other countries and i think that the the collapse of the soviet union was in part um fueled by that uh growing global trend but in 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 reverse, I think that the collapse of the Soviet Union allowed for that trend to be projected on a scale that would not have been possible otherwise. You know, the structural adjustment policies in Africa and the Middle East that, again, gave the United States and its camp free reign to impose financial and political regimes in developing countries that previously had alternative options, even if they were not perfect either. They at least had the opportunity to court Moscow and receive a different form of economic development. Uh, with the collapse of the Soviet Union and, and the wave of neoliberalism, I think that these things really fed off of each other in in, in a in a dialectical way, actually. So, um, you know, sometimes I've heard people say it's one way or the other, but I really think that that these that these effects really demonstrate um, the way that. Most of the time in in our in our world, causality really goes in both directions or in an infinite amount of directions, really. And I also think with the rise of the welfare state to start with had a big role with the Soviet Union because oh yeah. Well, one of the first welfare st- or social democracies as we know it in Western Europe happened in Finland, uh, with after after the the Russian Revolution. You had Mm -hmm. actually a right wing regime in Finland uh, implement things like uh, like a universal housing program, healthcare, and a lot of like big progressive reforms, but by a right wing regime, which is kind of confusing. But when you have the Soviet Union, like the first worker state beside you, and obviously for those who don't know, there was a Finnish revolution. There was a revolution in, in Finland that ultimately got toppled, but. A lot of these things, they exert a lot of pressure on the bourgeoisie of the countries, making giving them a big incentive to actually implement these reforms. And then, of course, you had the Great Depression uh, match, match, uh, matched with also the, the rise of the Soviet Union, which kind of gave a huge incentive for a welfare state in the United States. And more, uh, more ambitiously in Britain with Clement Attlee after World War II and uh, Charles de Gaulle in France and also um, Denmark, Norway, and Sweden uh, after World War II more so. One could argue whether this was more due to the Great Depression and the war or also possibly due to the rise of and the inspiration of workers' movements that were inspired by the Soviet Union. And I think maybe both are true, 
how correlated they are is debatable because of course, you know, one can trace the origins of the welfare state to like Bismarck and responding to 1848 revolutions mm-hmm. in Germany. Like, cause Bismarck of course, like implemented uh, the first social security program. So like we could trace it to before, but you didn't really see like this huge welfare state until like the Russian revolution after oh, yeah. that. It's undeniable that 1917 changed everything for most of the world, honestly. I mean, it, it really was, regardless of the events that occurred following the Russian Revolution, pretty much in the eyes of most of the, certainly the developing world, but even in, you know, the imperial core, it was a symbol. It was it was a warning symbol for the capitalists and a symbol of hope for the workers' movements. So, yeah, that, that uh, there's no question that that um, at least the inception of the Soviet Union, that the revolution itself was extremely um, connected to uh, social democracy and uh, you know the the strategic concessions made by the ruling class to placate what they feared could happen at home. And this, this is a really good segue to the first part as to causes of the. Um, decline of the Soviet Union. And I think it goes back to the very origin of the Soviet Union, really, because it was it was a system born in blood, uh, a lot of it not due to its faults, because, as you said, there was nothing that really shook the international bourgeoisie more than the 1917 revolution. Um, because you saw more hostility to the Soviet Union than even the early rise of Nazi Germany. And fascism. The thing that, for example, Britain was super obsessed with was strangling Bolshevism, as uh, Churchill put it. And in the case of, you know, before Churchill with uh, Neville Chamberlain as leader of uh, Prime Minister of Britain, they literally let, uh, later on, they let Hitler take Czechoslovakia. And when Soviet Union opposed a military alliance against an anti-fascist alliance against Nazi Germany, uh, France and England capitulated to Nazi needs, yeah. which says something about uh, how willing they were to stop uh, socialism and tolerate um, radical fascism. But before that, right, with the on with the onset of the re- revolution, obviously the big response to it from the international bourgeoisie was this counter revolution, which resulted in the civil war. With uh, correct me if I'm wrong, was it twelve countries? who were sending troops to aid the white army against the red like army 14 or 12. Yeah. It was, it was a pretty wide coalition of some of the biggest players. And it was 1921, 19, uh, which year was it exactly? The civil war in I forget, total. Uh, I forget. It was yeah. in 1920 or 1921, but it was in that time, right? It was like shortly yeah, after early the early 20s. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it is it is really blurry, the events that happened there, because really, like, you know, 1917 is no clean cut uh, situation, you know, oh, like, yeah, yeah, they took control <laughs> of the Winter Palace, but you still have a massive country and the remnants of a the largest empire that had existed in that time that you need to essentially secure. So you could argue the, the Civil War started basically then and there with the October Revolution and didn't end until like. I don't know, like 22, 23. Yeah, that's definitely a point because, I mean, it, the, Rus- the, the Russian Revolution is a topic of its own, really, because it's so complicated in terms of, you know, of course, there was the first revolution that brought the Kerensky government in power. And about, you know, just less than a year later, people who, dis- who were pissed off at the Kerensky government for still supporting the war, supported the Bolsheviks, is the Bolshevik October, of course, that's what we remember more, uh, which brought the Bolsheviks to power. For books, I would recommend for listeners who are not so well-versed in the Russian Revolution, uh, October by China Mievel and uh, A People's History of the Russian Revolution by Neil Faulkner. Those are really, really good ones. That's a, that's a whole thing of itself. But really, of course, this triggered a huge response from the international bourgeoisie with Obviously, not just the white army backed by um, the czars, but also a kind of a coalition between liberal bourgeois and um, the countries that ended up backing the white army uh, in the early 20s. Uh, 
was uh, America, Britain, France, Germany, Canada, uh, and Japan for different motives, mm-hmm. and probably a couple other countries I'm missing, Finland for sure. Uh, but you had all these countries basically team up and try to overthrow the Russian Revolution uh, with with that with the Civil War, and this is on top of another thing that I would argue kind of doomed the Soviet Union, which was the failure of the German Revolution in 1919. Which sure, a yeah. lot of like people like like Lenin and the Bolsheviks were banking on happening, like the banking on the revolution being international uh, revolutions in Germany, Poland, and Finland at the very least, which didn't succeed. Um, that all I think all these things with the civil war, which is one of the bloodiest conflicts in history, which we'll get into right now. I would argue that they kind of doomed the Soviet Union from the start. Doesn't mean that the Soviet Union had to end the way it did or be the way it did, but I would say it doomed communism. What I mean by communism is the idea that, you know, they could ever transition out of like a, a state socialism, so to speak. Interesting. I, I would definitely want to explore that more, um, perhaps even now, if you want. Um, Let's get straight I, into I, it. I, yeah. yeah, may or may not agree, depending on what you mean by, you know, doomed and, and like what level of sort of determinism we're talking about here. What I would mean is that I don't really think I don't buy the anarchist narrative or the left communist narrative. So like the anarchist narrative would be that the Bolsheviks shouldn't have seized state power. Instead, they should have kind of, you know, had a coalition of just the Soviets that would kind of be in like councils controlling mm-hmm. the Soviet Union rather than like state power, monopoly on violence, etc. Kind of convoluted, in my opinion, because when you consider the civil war, um, the situation was in it was, it was chaotic from the start, extremely chaotic with so many factions. It's hard to imagine a situation in which they couldn't impose some sort of order. And obviously, well, Lenin gets criticized a lot, which we can criticize in retrospect that he banned factions right during the civil war. Um, you know, it's kind of like an authoritarian move, uh, obviously, not what we wanted. That's why it was supposed to be temporary. But it's hard to imagine like what one would do in this civil war situation because there were three. Trotsky has an excellent quote where if the civil war, if the if the Red Army failed in the civil war and lost, fascism would have first happened in Russia. Mm. And I think that's a good point because really like the white army were committing straight up terror. Yeah. On the public. So like what I mean by doomed, I don't I mean that this idea that, uh, you know, Emma Goldman, the anarchist is famous for going to Russia around this time in the early 20s and being very disappointed and she famously said if the, you can't dance in the revolution i don't want it <laughs> and you have also the left communists who are kind of later pissed pissed off with the nep the new economic plan and maintaining like uh private property and commodity production i don't i'm very critical of these narratives that try to expect like that uh, of the ussr imposing socialism right away And what I mean by that is, this is what I mean by this. So did this civil war kind of doom socialism to a certain extent? Um, And I'm meaning that it still could have achieved something. It could have achieved a lot more. But uh, the ideals that people often project onto the Soviet project, I don't think were simply even possible with these circumstances. I don't know if you agree or not. And I'm, I'm sure you have a lot to add about just the whole context of the civil war and what that entailed. Yeah, I, I mean, one thing that, yeah, so I guess one thing that I'm still not clear on is like, it, it sort of depends on what we mean by doomed. Uh, yeah, I definitely see the uh, concern that the revolution being born in this precarious and very violent um, context is quite predisposed to needing to consolidate political power and that is exactly what ended up happening you know that's why there were no factions allowed that's why um the bolsheviks really had to operate as rigidly as possible because they were essentially um you know people forget that they weren't just fighting the whites they were fighting you know other factions as well there were like peasant armies that were not necessarily aligned with the two 
Um, there was also obviously like some degree of foreign contingents. Um, and this was at a time when logistics of war was not particularly um, well uh, established, especially in a country with limited infrastructure. So, you know, uh, yeah, the 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 chaos of the Civil War definitely created um, and projected itself onto the structure of the Soviet state moving forward. It was a necessity of survival. Um, but my question, I guess, is um, can we really picture a situation otherwise, you know, because the revolution, a communist revolution against the capitalist class, the capitalist system is almost by definition a civil war. And it will almost definitely in every situation rip a country into at least two parts, if not more. And how do you emerge from that with anything resembling stability and order and the capacity to rebuild beyond that and, you know, still be communist and not lose the conflict to, you know, like, like Trotsky was saying to, to, to the fascists or to other reactionary forces. So I, I don't have an answer to that, but it is like, sort of like a question um, to the question, you know, um, I, I can't, I can't think of a way that you would come out of that chaos without uh, a pretty strong level of discipline and order in order to, you know, not totally be dissolved by the different pressures there. I think what I would clarify by what I mean by doomed is that, you know, there's this, there's this notion of socialism of one country. And uh, of course, you know, the, the, the man himself, Joseph Stalin is known for uh, popularizing this, but it's not just Stalin who believed that this was possible. Obviously, like a lot of Bolsheviks, including ones who I tend to sympathize with more like Bukharin, also kind of believed socialism in one country was possible. And obviously, it's misleading by one country because the Soviet Union was, you know, a, a bunch right. of different regions like the Kazakhstan, uh, previously made of, you know, nomadic peoples, but given like countries, also Georgia, Ukraine, part of Soviet Union. And also eventually after World War II, the allied Eastern Bloc countries, which were were very autonomous from Soviet Union, but heavily influenced by uh, mm -hmm. like you know, Poland, um, Czechoslovakia, et cetera. But what I would say by doomed in, in Russia, in that region in general, is let's go back to what Marx himself said. So, and this is a thing I've heard a lot of, you know, the Orthodox Marxists make, and some of which Marxists in the Bolshevik and Menshevik parties made prior to the revolution and during the revolution, was that if you take Marx literally, socialism isn't possible until the phase of capitalism is gone through. Uh, countries that are fully industrialized, proletarianized, right, where the majority of the people are working class, propertyless proletariats, and undergo a high level of industrialization and urbanization. Uh, Engels also is, has a direct quote where he said the countries most possible for socialism were Germany and England. And then I think after Civil War, Marx said it was possible in uh, the United States after the uh, U.S. Civil War. Uh, they there's like very, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that they wouldn't think it's possible in a lot of developing countries. I know some people bring up the quote about how Marx said that the Irish proletariat would overthrow the British proletariat before the British, I'm sorry, would overthrow the British over before the British proletariat. But I think the evidence mostly suggests if one takes like Marx literally, is that a country like Russia just wasn't feasible. That whole general region was not feasible for socialism. And you could argue this about a lot of, you know, um, places where socialism has been, you know, quote unquote, tried is countries with semi-feudal conditions, meaning that it was basically a monarchy before with a big peasantry, very agrarian based economy, most people living in the countryside. Uh, peasants, of course, if they own property of some sort, like farms are less incentivized to you know want to uh, have like a have socialism which is the abolition of private property um there's, so there's all of that going on of course and also there's just the technological development 
the the access to technology to really make a society of abundance possible. There's all these factors that go into that. You know, there's some people who straight up, like um, the author of the book, Why the Fall of the Soviet Union was a triumph for Marxism. I think Steve Packin is the author. He makes the argument that uh, Russia, the Soviet Union, the Soviet experiment basically proved Marx's point, which I think is kind of reductive, obviously, because, you know, there's it didn't have to go that way. But I think there's some truth in the fact that it, it was all, it was already, already like a messy country to uh, try socialism in. Obviously, nobody predicted that the poorest countries would have would have successful revolutions and that German revolution would fail. Um, but that's kind of what I mean by Soviet Union doomed. I think by doomed, I mean that it was already going to be very hard task to establish socialism in that way. Yeah, I, I see. I, I have my some of my reservations about this really come from whether or not Marx himself was right. And also uh, whether Marx was operating on a kind of historical contextual bias that maybe didn't make him aware to different potential historical dynamics. So, you know, Marx was writing in the mid 19th century in England, mostly um, the, the worldview as is often reduced in, in by many Marxists of Marx is pretty linear and stages and that there's some necessity for like the accumulation of productive forces in order to go from a certain stage to the next stage. And there's a lot of that in Marx. Like it's pretty undeniable that that's sort of like the schema of most of his historical work. But I, I really think that I, I'm not very convinced by by this perspective. And I think that there are elements in Marx, like in the three volumes of Capital, that suggest that Marx was at least on some on the verge of some kind of reframing of his historical perspective. And um, the possibility, for example, of multiple modes of production existing in the same space and you know, creating frictions, perhaps, um, but that th those modes of production and the frictions that they create could produce any number of outcomes. Like there's this, uh, there's this letter that Engels writes to someone where he talks about like an infinite uh, a number array of pa parallelograms, essentially. So, you, so you're adding like an element of um, randomness and complexity to historical development that is sometimes missed when you make arguments like, oh, you know, Russia hadn't become capitalist yet uh and that's that's why the revolution was like misplaced that it should not have happened there or that if it did happen there it didn't have the the means necessary to create socialism and i just i'm not i'm not fully convinced by that i think historically we've seen that a lot of the revolutions have not happened in industrialized capitalist societies and i think there's something to be said about that I think there's something to be said about the very Eurocentric focus of that perspective of, you know, the, the only places that are really ripe for socialism are, I mean, you could count them on your hand, essentially, right? There's only a few countries in the world that are truly fertile ground for socialism. Well, now I think there's a whole lot more, but back in Marx's day, probably only a handful. Like, yeah, three I, I mean, right. But but my point is that maybe Marx was not completely right about this, or maybe the way that we're thinking about it is not exactly where Marx would be today, per se, if we even care about that to begin with. Because I have like this whole other thing about, you know, alternate uh, history. Uh, well, no, avoiding like dogmatism and sort of like, oh, you know, like Marx would have said this. And it's like, but maybe Marx was wrong about this, you know? Yeah, like, I agree. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, well, one thing Marx was definitely wrong about was just the historical stages of history because yeah, um, that's true. Like, I mean, he thought that, for example, the colonization of India was progressive because it would yeah, bring and, capitalism to uh, India. You know, And we obviously see like Lenin is definitely correct, more correct on the issue of like imperialism, which arises sort of more 
acutely mm-hmm. after Marx. And um, because the, uh, the idea of underdevelopment, right? Like some mm-hmm. capitalist countries will evolve at the expense of other countries. Right. So like a lot of countries will have like a capitalist mode of production, but be very inhibited due to imperialism and never really have the quote unquote, like productive forces that uh, capitalism is supposed to bring. It's the irony of Marx, right, is I think he was actually overly optimistic about capitalism, mm. whereas some people attribute him as like a person who just hated capitalism out of some right. moral reasons, right, which is not true at all. But I would say what I, the, the perspective I am sympathetic to is that there is a level, what is definitely true is that, and definitely, I mean, what Marx got wrong is that the revolutions certainly do not hap- didn't happen or didn't succeed in the most developed countries, um, they happened in the opposite in the most uh, underdeveloped countries. Not, right. but that's not to say that being under having an underdeveloped mode of production makes you more likely to have a revolution. Because right. then there's the whole like question of the Middle East, right? Or like, why isn't there socialist revolutions there? I don't. There's many factors. I think like ideology plays a bigger role than people think, as mm-hmm. opposed to the economic determinism. But I would say there's there's truth in the idea that having like the productive forces developed and also having a bourgeoisie to expropriate as well as a proletariat who has the incentive to want socialism because with a country that's like largely peasantry like Russia with the the Russia that Lenin inherited you had a huge class divisions right which really acutely manifested themselves with um with stout with collectivization under stalin obviously that was we'll get maybe to that a bit later but that didn't end so well and the uh, the alliance with the peasantry was sort of shaky to begin with and there was a reason right why um bukharin and lenin constructed the new economic policy which basically introduced a very controlled form of capitalism in russia to you know develop the forces of production guided by you know the dictatorship of the proletariat but it was a form of capitalism right a very different form of capitalism than we, yeah. we see in liberal countries a very like guided capitalism and right before he died lenin said that the soviet union was state capitalist and i think some yeah. people they misunderstand that to say oh it was just like uh, i don't know the united states mm-hmm. and no obviously but the point it was is like they also saw a degree that you know you needed a bit of capitalist development before socialism, and obviously on the more rightist end, you had people like Kamenev and uh, Zinoviev, who straight up thought like revolution was like we shouldn't even we should just have liberalism. They thought <laughs> like um, a system like like a liberal capitalist democracy was preferable before things were ready. Right. So there was obviously like a lot of people in the Bolsheviks, including Lenin, didn't think like, you know, socialism was Russia was ready for socialism right away. So I think there's some truth to it. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I think so, too, for sure. I just think, you know, like how much of this is uh, how much of this the Soviet experience in the first half of its history, almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Like the a lot of the Soviet leadership come into the decisions that they make on the basis of this fairly simple historical schema, right? And then they proceed to proletarianize. Um, I, I mean, I think what they did was they engaged in very rapid and sometimes very heavy handed primitive accumulation, right? Like the same stuff that we saw play out in Western Europe and America, well, America to a lesser extent, but certainly like in, in, in Europe where they went from feudalism to capitalism, that took like hundreds of years, really. Um, yeah. it, the a lot of Union oppression, was, right? Like a lot of right. force with the enclosure it, acts. It was left with this task. Uh, now, whether it should have done this task is my question, right? Whether that was necessary to build socialism, I don't know, but they believed it to be so. And as a result, they... They, I mean, they did succeed, right? I mean, they created a, a very urbanized industrial society that very much emulated the historical trajectory of uh, capitalist Europe, but just at a much faster pace and honestly on a much larger scale. And that came with a lot of consequences. And historically, like this is what we have now in the former Soviet Union. This is the legacy that we've been left with. But my 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 uh, my question is that I'm agnostic towards is, 
did they really need to do that? You know, were there other options, you know, could there have been a more organic development that wasn't sort of an imposition of a very specific historical model? Are you um, referring to the NEP or the collectivization? Because both were forms of primitive accumulation, but different. I mean, I think really like most of um, the the efforts made by the Soviet Union to achieve that did, like critical degree of proletarianization and urbanization and industrialization, which includes the NEP as much as it does like collectivization and Stalin's industrialization policies, like all of these uh, pretty extreme efforts to push the country forward um, were one way or another an emulation of what was observed as a historical trend in the west now it was done very consciously you know it was like a specific state policy pushed forward by a specific uh theory and individuals um so it's not like europe in the sense that in europe it developed like very organically and historically in, in the soviet union they did all of that in the span of like 30 or 40 years and they got there ultimately i think right i mean they most of the population was urbanized educated industrialized um but you know whether that was yeah, the path they point, had to take though. yeah yeah like with the the i think with the 30 industrializing in 30 years definitely it was more the collectivization that played a role with that which obviously came a bit later but that's an interest there's there was that debate always within the bolshevik party of the different roads of development because there's one thing that's for sure, and that is the transition between modes of production can often be pretty brutal. Yeah. Just proletarianization is, is brutal in general because it involves a class of people like the peasantry basically having to change their entire lifestyle. And, you know, but having something that they kind of own, like farms, to not owning anything and having nothing to sell but your way, uh, but, but your labor. And really, there's a there's many ways like this can happen. It can happen like slowly through enclosure acts, or it can happen really fast as uh, the USSR sort of needed because they needed to have build like a very heavy industry yeah. to fight the eventual German war machine and what they thought also would be the the British war machine right. that would come after them. So there was a degree of urgency needed for sure, but there was sort of a debate between the parties to how to do that. Uh, at, the, at the start, the consensus seemed to be the new economic plan, which actually Stalin also supported. Really, the opposition at the start to the new economic plan, uh, Trotsky opposed it, and uh, Trotsky supported a thing called socialist primitive accumulation, mm. which, you know, in hindsight, looked actually dangerously a lot like Stalin's collective forced collectivization. Uh, which is ironic, obviously, because Trotsky ended up uh, opposing Stalin's uh, forced collectivization. But of course, you know, the idea of a new economic plan, a highly guided state capitalism that has, I hate the word socialistic, but like you know, socialistic elements, there's a clear drive to socialism. But the thing that why it was so difficult to have like a forced proletarianization, socialist primitive accumulation is because the revolution itself was built on an alliance between the proletariat and the peasantry, right? That's quite literally part of what the hammer and sickle symbolizes right. is, you know, the, this, the sickle being for like, uh, you know, the, the peasantry, the hammer for the proletariat, for those who don't know. <laughs> um, and really like uh, they knew that some sort of development, some form of fast forwarding, I guess the forces of production was sort of like inevitable, but they didn't want, the problem is that if it was supercharged by the Communist Party, it would cause a sort of bad taste in the peasantry's mouth right. and for, like a big resentment. So that, that's part of why, yeah, Lee, you know, Lenin was very opposed to Trotsky's socialist primitive accumulation. And this idea of a forced collectivization or socialist primitive accumulation is one wants to call it, I guess, where it's like a state, state, state run Force collectivization. I don't know how to word it really in layman's terms, but um, that idea didn't really, it wasn't taken seriously until the threat, until Nazis, the Nazis took power. And there was this yeah. urgent right when like, you know, by this time Stalin was in power. And I guess maybe this is a segue. Stalin said, we have to do uh, what the British did in 70 years, in 20 years. Yeah. 
And like this idea of collectivization, which we associate now is like when the USSR became quote unquote socialist, that was like, it's not, that was not part of the plan. That was just a result of shit. We need to build heavy industry as fast as possible. Let's have a command economy that's state directed, that is productive as possible. And as yeah. a result, you know, uses an insane amount of repression to, you know, boost quotas and stuff like that. So like, I don't know, to what extent did this mode of production really like evolve out of, evolve by accident? You know, what we now call in retrospect and some, some, a lot of the Marxist Leninists like to say, you know, under Stalin is when Soviet Union first became socialist. I mean, it was obviously socialist in tendency, but when it transitioned to socialist mode of production uh, by the state, you know, owning everything and whatnot, they kind of attribute collectivization to that. But from my reading of history, this is more like <laughs> combined kind of accident almost that was as a result of the urgency that World War II imposed. Well, this is a theme that I think we should hold on to for most of this conversation. Um, this idea that um, we, I think we should never separate or even dichotomize the, the domestic from the geopolitical. And it's the case really for every country at any point in time. And the more so in modern history where countries are a lot more connected and, and the, the policies that they enact within and without their borders affect other countries. But this is very much the case here too. You know, like I, I say like, oh, could the Soviet Union have done things differently? But pretty clearly by the evidence of history, had it not industrialized at the rate that it did, had it not developed an economy that, you know, vertically structured or not was capable of redirecting necessary resources and moving both people and equipment as quickly as possible had it not done those things you know would it have even survived world war ii i per personally i think no um so that again we're playing sort of like what ifs yes, and alternate, alternate history yeah yeah which is a difficult we shouldn't question. apologize for that because that's kind of the whole point of this exercise but yeah yeah um but I mean, you know it's it's, it's hard because the thing is, is where I, well, the take I'm sympathetic to, right, is there's some people who will use World War II as a sort of like apologism for the tragedies that um, forced collectivization resulted in, like, you know, um, like uh, the famines in Kazakhstan and Ukraine, which some people call a genocide. You have a great video on that, which is good because it doesn't do the weird apologist thing where... You know, it was, oh, it was just because they needed to export grain and they had to do it. Yeah. But you do attribute it to like so failed Soviet policy, but also debunk the idea that this was like an intentional genocide or something, which right. is like what the kind of Robert conquests of the world do. Mm. Uh, the kind of right wing historians. But for regardless, everyone knows that forced collectivization resulted in a in massive, massive tragedies. The only the take I would say is that what does what does this mean? There's some people who take a reading from this and say like this, you know, Stalin brought socialism. They needed to do this to develop the war machine. Whereas I, I if you I read this as like a lot of this wasn't uh, a lot of this was kind of winging it. If that oh, makes yeah. sense, like the Bolsheviks completely winging their policy because you know they they were prepared. I see. Here's what I, I believe that forced collectivization wasn't necessary because it was Nazi Germany who they were primarily fighting. But if you take into context as to what they thought they were going to fight, which was both Nazi Germany and the British, it makes a little more sense why they had that sense of urgency to have, you know, the state completely control everything. But like, we have to just be clear, like this resulted in insane amounts of tragedies, like essentially like a sort of gulag economy, uh, because you had a lot of people sent to the gulags who didn't meet production quotas and what this ended up happening is like the people in the gulags were used for free labor basically and there was a structural incentive to like increase the amount of people in the gulags and obviously like you know some people will say it wasn't stalin himself who did this it was the nkvd you know it was other people in the bolsheviks leadership it's like sure whatever but it still happened right you know and i think we have to acknowledge that I don't know. I think this maybe brings us to the debate as to like collectivization and what um, and World War II, really, because, you know, you, as you said, we can't separate the geopolitical.
Yeah, I, I was going to say quickly, I read a book recently um, by uh, Paul Gregory, I think, uh, The Economics of Forced Labor and the Soviet Gulag. And it's interesting. Um, it's definitely like not sympathetic to the Soviet Union, really, probably at all. <laughs> um, so, you know, but it is still it, it, it goes over a lot of like data and specific places and industries where gulag labor was very important and where it was not and it's just interesting to see like you know how prison labor was used and how both narratives kind of um dress the situation up you know the people who say that it was not really an integral part of the soviet economy in any way obviously that's not true because there are some sectors and parts of the production process that were like very staffed by gulag labor but the other people who say that oh you know the soviet union and it's all of its achievements were built on the backs of like you know 50 million gulag prisoners is also yeah, Rob, robert you know, conquest basically that's like, right robert like, conquest con conquestism essentially um and it's also that, hypocritical if you consider just how capitalist countries oh developed yeah with slavery right. and imperialism yeah i mean you know charge us with what about ism but uh kind of the summary of what we just talked about is you know, maybe the Soviet Union was not a utopian socialist society, but it wasn't some kind of insane exception to the rule. It more or less cements the fact that um, modernization everywhere that it's happened and the transition from uh, pre-modern economies to modern economies has just been devastating pretty much everywhere. I mean, in Europe as much as in the Soviet Union and then later in China. I mean, I... I'm kind of cynical in that regard. And I wonder if there's has, has ever been a possibility to do it better <laughs> uh, with less suffering and, and death is ultimately all of this is paid for with the blood, sweat and tears of ordinary people. But well, you know. I, I could suggest there was this idea of like Bukharin, which was like the, the private producers uh, who were large peasants, basically uh, competing with collective collective farms mm. and uh and this she had a similar idea actually proposed by anarchists too in like catalonia which was i know like obviously like a kind of like meme or whatever <laughs> short experiment but i think it's still an interesting idea of like the government run firms competing with the private firms and you had something like this happen under mao too uh under mao's early you know a, a socialist experiment the problem is with Mao, though, is he like penalized the people who are more productive, which I thought was like a totally stupid idea uh, because, you know, to eliminate the inequalities and such. But I think it's an interesting idea as to like how to, you know, like you have a more voluntary collectivization, like it's an idea I'm more sympathetic to as opposed to at gunpoint, because it is not an easy case to sell, if that makes sense. Like, um, obviously, we don't have that same degree of obstacle today because most countries with the exception of a few uh, are largely proletarianized, do not have huge peasants peasantries, but um, I still think, you know, there was a future of development available that wasn't, you know, forcing the peasantry at gunpoint. Well, you know, I, I think that's definitely true to some extent. I, I do think that that it is important to remember, like, I'm not going to speak for the Chinese case because I don't know as much about it. But in the Soviet Union, um, while most of the population was uh, peasantry at the time of the revolution in the early years, it is important to, to distinguish between, you know, the degree of wealth and the fact that this was even possible really did rest to some extent on um a stratum of the peasantry and by most accounts probably a majority stratum of the peasantry that was essentially nothing more than agricultural proletariat in some way like they had really no possessions of their own and were working as hired labor for the more wealthy peasantry so you know it's right. not it's the not infamous like infamous kulaks right yeah, yeah. and, and the, the the kulak question is very uh touchy because oh, yeah it attracts two different kind of people right and uh, <laughs> you know 
it became a weaponized distinction, this like classes between the peasants thing, you know, like lower, middle and upper. But there is a historical reality to it. And the fact is, you know, the repressions in the Soviet Union and collectivization are often painted to be very strictly top down phenomena. But in from what I have read, like, you know, from a lot of the revisionist historians, and I think you mentioned like Sheila Fitzpatrick and yeah. some other people. Um, when you re-examine it, you realize that um, much like, for example, in the Cultural Revolution, there really was an, a, a bottom-up fervor as well, because there were millions of people who had experienced like generations of oppression, just like from so-called fellow peasants, you know, like rich landowning peasantry who would abuse the majority of the agricultural workers in one way or another, either like physically or economically, mostly both. So selling it, selling collectivization to the poor peasantry was not very difficult. And they were often the activists on the ground promoting the idea of socialist agriculture and collectivization. And they were often the ones clashing with the kulaks who were like, no, hold on a minute. But of course, in the crossfires between that, we lost a lot of people who were deemed kulaks because you know, for some, you know, resistance or whatever. And they were not obviously like they just were, you know, um, innocent bystanders in this eruption, this social upheaval that was going to come one way or another. Yeah, essentially. And I think the thing you're alluding to is one thing that kind of caused, uh, well, most certainly the the famines in Ukraine and Kazakhstan that who are hit the hardest part of it had to do with yeah kulaks hoarding a lot of grain but the thing is is some people weaponize this argument like especially the marxist leninist types will use this argument to say it was like a fault of the kulaks and hence mm -hmm. they like all deserve to be like executed and the problem with this is there's a certain degree i think to which like the kulaks hoarding grain was sort of inevitable with this sort of forced collectivization system. It's like, a, it's a degree of hard power that isn't just, it is simply isn't going to be received very well. You know, like they should have been prepared for this reality. And there's the second factor, which is, I mean, the whole command economy itself. And, you know, I obviously, I differentiate the command economy and central planning because central planning was a feature really throughout most of the USSR's history but the command economy, I would say, is more of a feature of like the war economy under Stalin prior to World sure. War II. And there was a big problem with the war economy where you had these strict quotas that were so sometimes high that, that there was an incentive to lie. Yeah. And this was the exact same problem that you know, Mao faced under uh, the, the Great Leap Forward famine. Is there was a huge incentive to literally for producers to, and bureaucrats to lie about their quotas. Course, yeah and you had like a huge mismatch of problems of, of calculation and like a uh, harvest that were far below expectations i mean like this was a huge failure of soviet polis policy which i don't think you know like i think a lot of people recognize but some might not there's like there is like this narrative that it was the kulaks that this was inevitable i'm kind of skeptical about that like obviously there was going to be cash some degree of casualty but there was this like urgency to, you know, export as much grain as possible so that they could, you know, import technology to ramp up their military. And without a really big regard to the populations of the countries where they're extracting the most grain, like, you know, Ukraine and like, uh, of course, Kiev specifically and um, Kazakhstan. A big part of it was it was not merely an accident. It was pretty much like a big consequence of the command economy. And I think it's worth acknowledging that, I think, because it, it, it avoids the trap of saying it was just the kulaks and the other extreme, which is, you know, this was like a genocide of some sort. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, the kulaks did it is a very silly and reductive argument. But, you know, I... I, I... It's the argument that the Soviet government used, like uh, that Stalin used, like this was publicized in the newspapers. Like that sure. there was like that yeah. allying and, with the Nazis and all that shit. And um, that was the kind of political propaganda that was necessary to further mobilize 
what was already happening. I mean, this is uh, honestly even a pre-revolutionary tendency, you know, the, the clash between the poor peasantry and the landowning peasantry and also obviously the nobility. This was a, a bubbling tension for many, many years, honestly, probably centuries, um, especially since like the emancipation of the serfs in the mid eight, mid 1800s. Right, yeah. But, you know, um, the Soviet state uh, leveraged that tension. And of course, the the interests of the Soviet state were against the propertied class since, you know, the structure that they were trying to set up was uh, quite inimical to the idea of, you know, a landed peasantry. Uh, but, you know, if you think about how other countries industrialized, it, it always strikes me how similar it really was in the end, right? I mean, um, the Soviet Union had to export its agricultural products in order to buy equipment in and order to only grain too, right? There was the embargo. Like that's worth uh, highlighting too. Yeah, right? there, yeah. There they, was the they embargo. Weren't... They could only trade in grain. Right, exactly. They were very deliberately starved out of most of the global market, which was which made this task uniquely difficult for them in a way that it had not been for the European countries who got to enjoy the spoils of, you know, colonialism and imperialism in order to develop the technology necessary to become advanced capitalist countries. So, um, but, you know, the, the, the premise is still kind of the same, you know, that you, that you switch out agriculture for machinery over time. I mean, pretty much every, advanced capitalist society started out with like exporting some kind of like agricultural crop. It was like, you know, in the U S it's like probably like tobacco and cotton or whatever. And, um, yeah, in England. cotton's produced by slaves. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so, I mean, I'm not, maybe it's cynical to say things, but things like this, but I really just like, I see like this continuity in terms of like what it takes for a country to move from pre-modern, economy to you know what we would call well, like an industrialized country well you know there i'll give it the dang here's the thing the dangus will make the argument which i think there's some weight to it that a lot of you know for example the great leap forward because if you like bring it i know this is like china situation very different from russia but we can apply it the same logic a bit is that the great leap forward could have been avoided if we just did what dang did but earlier things reforms which were obviously like a much more extreme version of like what bukharin wanted hmm. uh i don't even like to compare it because like they played out so differently but the I, the thing is okay the the fact is is that china has been able to like proletarianize and industrialize and create a huge rise in living standards with yeah. a form of like state capitalism right mine with here i think there was huge brutalities right with the whole factories uh terrible working conditions all that stuff but like without famines without gulags i mean there's an argument that like there was a different path and i am a little bit sympathetic to the kind of rightist line i guess which is like the, the right communist line which was the rightist communist line which was like you know you had to do capitalism first there's a, I'm always sympathetic to that just because of like the whole Chinese experience and also kind mm -hmm. of the, you know, Vietnamese experience too, with kind of taking a similar road um, there. Cause they had, have had like a degree of success. I mean, with their form of state capitalism. And I wonder, you know, I think the only thing that would have stopped Russia from taking this path is like, would, like you said, the geopolitical situation with uh, having to amp up, state-led heavy industry to fight the war so maybe that wasn't possible but i think rather than thinking about it from like a what if uh alternate history point of view i think what we could do best is probably just like, explain to the viewers what happened and like the different causes as to what like led to the down what like hindered soviet development or uh led to you know a lot of the catastrophes associated with uh, the Soviet Union? Maybe yeah, like that I would mean, be a better way to frame it. Uh, just to foreshadow, I think that the answer, for me, the answer to this question is, is um, in the 60s and 70s with um, 
the renewed debate on uh, how socialist planning could be done and, you know, cybernetics and uh, honestly, even just like various mathematical approaches to optimizing resource allocation and planning, which we'll get into that later. But, but you know, I think my, my perspective in brief is that that was the turning point, more or less, and that all of the stuff that preceded it, you know, was overdetermined by factors both within and without the country that, um, yeah, there's a lot of what ifs there. Uh, but... with cent- we could actually get to central planning on the part two on your channel. But uh, before that, because there's so- like I would have a lot to say about the central planning stuff, because obviously that was a feature throughout the Soviet Union, not uh, not just Stalin period, which we're still on. But I think what's another thing important to like highlight is part of the things that kind of caused all these huge inefficiencies in uh, the command economy. Obviously, as I mentioned, there was the problem of simply simply uh, people lying about how much they're producing, which is a problem with you know a, a, a system where heavy quotas are imposed and there isn't a, a system that really, which, you know, you could argue this could be fixed by like cybernetics, that uh, a system where that in- actively like incentivizes people to lie because the bureaucrats will basically get punished if they don't uh, meet their quotas. And so will the farmers. So there's, and the workers. So there's th- this problem. There's also, we should, got a touch on Lyshenko. <laughs> okay. I'm sure, you, I'm sure you, know, you, know, you know what I mean by uh, uh, Lyshenkoism? Yeah. Uh, that was like a thing in under Mao too, but like Lyshenko, just for those who don't know, promote this like weird unscientific idea of like applying Marxist historical materialism to agriculture. And basically his plans and that Stalin ended up listening to, which a lot of other people were skeptical of. I'm just to really simplify. You probably might have a better way of explaining this because I find this hard to explain. But his like agriculture plans were completely unscientific and more based in like ideology and led to like really bad crop failures and like miscalculations and ultimately like a bad harvest. Well, and, like, and that I, contributed I, to the one of the that contributed to to an extent to like the uh, Ukraine and Kazakh famines. I'm not sure. See, that's the thing is, I'm not sure. I haven't read um, in detail like the specific connections between Lysenkoism and the onset of the famines. Like, I've done, I've read a lot about the famines themselves, but nothing that specifically mentions like this. The, so, the Lysenkoist genetic theory is like non Darwinian. I think it comes from like the Lamarckian tradition. And in that time, there was still like debate about the nature of genes and genetics and like how organisms respond to external environmental um effects essentially and the if i'm not it was like a weird it was like it was very like unscientific like that's what, what i understand about it. it was it was like a this attempt to create like proletarian science so to speak well it was um the the premise in the in the context of the crops for Lysenko was that um yeah through some kind of extrapolation of a dialectical materialism that uh the that crops could respond um to um uh, environmental shocks and that, that that can actually change like their um genetic evolution in a way um, now, I, I, if I if I'm remembering correctly, Lysenko wasn't particularly convinced about genes in general, so that also played into it. But I think that the idea was essentially through like sort of extreme uh, su- subjecting grain, for example, to extreme circumstances would like produce new kinds of seed that might be like more resistant to weather issues or you know yeah. potential complications in- it's hard that's why it's so hard to explain like because I, I i'm more for like the the tldr for the audience is basically there was this kind of very untested risky theory 
that a lot of people of agriculture, that a lot of people in the Bolsheviks doubted, right? And a lot of, uh, including farmers actually also, like really were skeptical of this. But Stalin was very convinced by this. And so were, you know, some of his close allies like Molotov. And um, the problem is, is like they listened to what they wanted to hear too much. I think like the, the lesson often from that experience is the Soviet leadership. You know, when I say talk about obviously like under Stalin probably was when Soviet Union was like at its most autocratic, like dictatorial in the sense that he had like a huge sway. But at it, it was never like a full dictatorship, like, you know, Nazi Germany, where like Hitler was like the official Fuhrer or whatnot. But you had like a huge power that like Stalin had and his closest allies like Molotov, where if they wanted to, uh, if they wanted to believe something and it was something that they were told that they wanted to hear, they would put that into practice sometimes, even if it wasn't like the best idea. And sometimes if they were suggested as to alternative ideas, it would be very hostile to that. And I think that's another point I want to segue a little bit to, which is the whole problem of, of civil liberties and rights and democracy in the USSR, particularly in the Stalin period. I think it's where it's the most problematic. Like, for example, you know, Stalin, uh, Bukharin, you know, he, one of the most loyal Bolsheviks, Lenin was touted him as one of the favorites of the party, ended up being executed by Stalin in a complete show trial, you know, after uh, Bukharin opposed uh, forced collectivization and allied with the right opposition. And it's like, that should be normal if you have like some degree of like party democracy and collective leadership, you should have that disagreement be allowed, but you know, he was executed. And I think this brings us to a whole other thing is if you have a system uh, that is very rigid and very intolerant to different party, pers different perspectives in the party, you can allow bad ideas to go unchecked like Lyshenkoism. And you can also make it hard. The party can become detached from like reality, if that makes sense. And this is like a whole other topic, but I'm sure you also have a lot to say about, you know, uh, free speech in the USSR and stuff like that. Because I think, you know, it's, it's the thing I think the MLs most avoid, like they avoid the most. And I know I don't like to go in the trap of like the, whatever, the other extreme, which is, I don't know, like authoritarianism, because yeah, any state is going to have a degree of authoritarianism. But yeah. the, 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 there was like really bad, like almost totalitarianism. No, I, think, I do think that if we're talking about causes for causes is a strong word, but let's say like elements uh, and tendencies in Soviet history that contributed to its ultimate demise, I do think that the absence of Plur of sufficient pluralism within the party was extremely problematic. I think, I mean, Lysenkoism is one example, but really just like in general, um, you know, with the consolidation of the party uh, following the, the, the power struggle in the late 20s, uh, where the left and the right camps essentially were booted out and their well, and the center wasn't really like the center in, in, in the way that it was in the beginning. So like this ideological consolidation became really problematic for sure. Uh, and and it, it is tragic to me that in this political climate in which Stalin is by no means like sole instigator or, you know, like there's a lot of like liberal narratives where it's like, yo, he's pulling all the strings. This is just like all of his like yeah. 4D chess level Machiavellian maneuvers to like boot everyone out of the court like this was yeah, i look like, at it more like it was the structural autocracy yeah of, of the party and specifically like the nkvd right like, yeah like it, it was it was a complex sort of multifactional struggle but we should which... be clear though it's like there's some people like you know like grover for like the apologist types who say stuff like yeah it was the nkvd's fault not stalin's fault oh, stalin yeah. wanted to democratize the ussr and it's just a way of kind of like avoiding the totalitarianism question because yeah, like, sure. Yeah. Of course, Stalin didn't have like as nearly as much power as like the, the libs thought he did, you know, and even like the CIA, there's a thing that I know like the people like to bring up is that the CIA had like a document that said Stalin yeah, is yeah. a dictator, blah, blah, blah. Like yeah. It was collective leadership. Yeah. It was still like a to pretty totalitarian in that period. It was really hard to dissent. And there was a reason why like after de-Stalinization, under Khrushchev, there was 
a lot of dissent that always existed, but before like was actually able to speak, you know, because there was this is what like the Soviet Union lost tragically. And I think what actually China lost too in its power struggles was like the presence of basically these three camps, like the left center and the right. And I think that their existence was very important. Like, you know, the left, in my opinion, the left camp presents like a necessary element within the political structure that is almost always critical. And it's like, oh, we're not really like, you know, like we're not thinking about long term, you know, like, are we really building socialism? Like, are these policies sufficiently like moving us forward? And the the right is sort of like the grounding voice being like, here's what we can immediately do. And like, yeah, we do have to make certain like policy concessions in order to achieve um, short and medium term goals. So like having these can and then the center maybe like as a bridge between that, you know, and the absence of these camps eliminated the potential for like generating new outcomes. Now I don't think that that was completely absent yeah. in the Soviet Union. Oh, but- that that's such a point though, because like this suppression of the of free speech really haunted the USSR because at, at one point they they were resistant to a lot of technological innovations. I mean, this kept its way with you know the conservative turn under Brezhnev, which will obviously this is foreshadowing a little bit. But, you know, they, they banned photocopiers at one point uh, under Brezhnev because there was like this fear of information getting mm-hmm. out of control of the state. And that's like a pretty serious indictment. And also as a, another foreshadow, I, I know we're going to talk about cybernetics, but the development of the Internet was pretty much really heavily s- suppressed by the bureaucracy and, or, right. or like viewed with suspicion because just any idea of transparency of the of information being spread was a threat to the party leadership. Like there was, I mean, this is the problem with totalitarianism, right? As people think all totalitarianism is the same, but I think that was a feature of the Soviet union, which pretty much very much led to its demise because it made it hard to evolve for new ideas to get in. And I think Lee Phillips, you know, author of people's Republic of Walmart, he has a quote that uh, it was, it wasn't, it's not that socialism is inherently totalitarian. It's that totalitarianism impairs socialism. Like that it prohi- it makes socialism like, you know, it ruins socialism. It makes it unlikely to happen. That's part of that is the new ideas, developments and whatnot. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I, well, first of all, coming from like a political science background, I have like an aversion to the term totalitarianism because well, it, it me ends- too as well. Because like yeah, it, yeah. fucking Cuba is called totalitarian, right? Right. I, and I want to I want to clarify, like I don't think the USSR was always totalitarian, but I think it was in, in every way <laughs> under uh, Stalin. It's just I even think- though if it wasn't a dictatorship, it was still like totalitarian. I think I, I, that- think, I think America under the Red Scare was totalitarian. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it depends, you know, if you define totalitarianism as like um, a, a rigid political structure guided by a single ideology and no other ideology, then, you know, Basically. that's a very broad application that you could. But it's also a to. very big control of information. Yes. Yeah. Right. Because, like, for example, I would like, you know, some uh, modern Russia, like Putin's Russia. I, I is like a very authoritarian regime, but I wouldn't call it totalitarian because there is like a level of dissent. It's just that nobody actually with dissent has the power to change anything. It's kind of like it's almost like the US, except if there wasn't a Democratic and Republican Party to a certain sure. extent. Yeah, right? I mean, aesthetically, they're different, but there's a lot of bridges there. There's a lot. Yeah, but it's still like there's a difference like between. You know, like, okay, you know, people like to act like all actually existing socialism is the same, but let's look at like North Korea versus Cuba. There's a clear difference in one being vastly more totalitarian. In Cuba, you can't, in uh, North Korea, you can't leave the country. In Cuba, you can leave the country. Whenever you want. (laughs) So, in like East, East, same with East Germany, East Germany, you couldn't leave the country. And I feel like uh, USSR, obviously, like under Khrushchev, they ameliorated it so that you could leave the country if you applied for like, you know, you had to uh, go through like this bureaucratic process to travel. There are specific conditions. I think it was especially um, easy if you were 
emigrating to like Israel on the basis of like, you know, if you were like ethnically identifying as Jewish, like that was an easy way to leave the Soviet Union. But yeah, no, the travel. That, that, I think that is like a feature of totalitarianism in the sense that there is like a very big enclosing, it's closing society off to anything else. And, you know, this might bring us to another thing, but a thing that like the ML sometimes criticized Khrushchev of is competing with the West. Mm. And the thing is, I think there's some inevitability to that because if people are aware of other societies, they're going to compare those societies in some way. And the only way you can prevent that is by completely closing that society off, which is, you know, really what the Soviet Union did. And at its most extreme, you can look at a society that's closed off in the world as like, you know, North Korea, uh, Ceausescu's Romania, and uh, Enver Hoxha's Albania as being like probably the most closed off societies. And I mean, that only works for so long. And usually when people are aware of like the other side, it it just comes crashing down kind of like <laughs> East Germany. And also if you yeah. keep people under the dark so much of like the rest of the world, what ends up happening is they end up imagining about what the West is like. And a lot of people, because they didn't know what the West is like, they started imagining that it was like this consumer paradise. For sure. No, so they I mean, had like is... unrealistic expectations of it. And I think that part of that was the fault of like the suppression of liberties. Yeah, my um, my father grew up in the Soviet Union. And, and I think he he told me once, like, you know, the propaganda there was uh, it was exactly backwards. Like they spent too much time not telling people enough about the West. You know, like they, they spent too much time saying about how great it was in the Soviet Union. And, you know, don't think about the West. Uh, and not enough time, like just honestly reporting why the West is no great place to immigrate to, you know, and and that that like absence of sufficient and transparent critical information fostered this fantasy that capitalism and the West is just so much better off in every way. And it it took the 90s for a lot of people to realize that that actually is bullshit, but they didn't really have the capacity to make that conclusion until they saw it for themselves really <clears throat> but uh just Wait, to which, go back which uh which era of, uh, of the soviet union did your uh, dad live under that's interesting uh i'm always I mean, curious to much, hear that <laughs> pretty much all it was pretty much all brezhnev and obviously then you know the late the late characters uh, androkov and uh later gorbachev so yeah like yeah, basically the tail end of it, but sufficient enough that it was like, like he grew up in, he wasn't like, you know, one of those people was like, oh, I lived in the Soviet Union, but there were like five when they were in the Soviet, you know, like he really, <laughs> you know, went through the entire school system and everything. Like Lex so, Friedman, you know, you know, Lex Friedman. I, I, that name sounds familiar. He's, but... the, he's a Rush, he's a Russian podcaster. He's basically like Joe Rogan, but with science. Oh, great. And, uh, he always uses plays the card like I was born in the Soviet Union. Oh, he, sure. was born, he was born in like 1989. Oh, yeah. I mean, technically, I have a Soviet <laughs> passport, but like, fuck, do I yeah. know about the Soviet Union? Um, like in real lived experience. But, you know, it, it and that that isn't that's a whole other thing is like, that's why I like reading revisionist historians. Um you can't because, be a revisionist, man. Revisionism is bad. I, Mao told it, yeah, me revisionism is, is the devil. Revisionism in the <laughs> Western joking. sense, yeah, of, of course. course. I know what you mean. But you should explain that to the audience, though, because some there's some people who only heard the word revisionist oh, sure. from Mao. So yeah, no, like, yeah. There's I'm a talking... different use in like the way in like the way historians right. use the word revisionist is different. Yeah, I mean, broadly speaking, historical revisionism is just like you know a new interpretation of previous narratives sometimes almost completely opposed to the old one and in the context of like sovietology as it existed there was like a dominant robert conquest style narrative Evil empire right and then the newer generations of historians with access to the archives and personal accounts yeah, of Ar Soviet Getty citizens. as well yeah like you know sheila fitzpatrick ronald suny you know like uh when you read them there's this astounding focus on the actual people and less like th the criticism that they mount against Sovietology in part is that it's too like 
the narrative itself is too top down. Not that the it's Soviet a great Union man of is history. top down. It's a right, great man of history narrative. The focus yeah. obscures any kind of bottom up consideration. And and like if you read like Fitzpatrick, for example, or Sunni, you'll see like yeah, I've, I've read Everyday Stalinism by uh, mm-hmm. Sheila Fitzpatrick. It's and like and, and she's one. really good. I mean, like uh, even in the time that you would expect there to be the least sort of political mobility, like in the 30s and 40s and 50s, um, if you focus on like how like, you know, like in my video about women in the Soviet Union, how the average factory worker who's a woman could you know, participate in politics and make significant changes in her workplace and, you know, become a member of local politics and even regional or the Supreme Soviet. Like, this is a kind of element of the narrative that is obscured when you look at it from the, like, pre-revisionist perspective and where... Yeah, it's you- more balanced. Like, the, you have to praise, like, some of the accomplishments, right? And that's the thing that the the rightists, the right, the right wingers and the liberals won't want to do. They don't want to acknowledge that. Yeah. Like there was a huge, uh, achievement of women's rights in the Soviet union and Eastern Europe, especially East Germany. And just, you know, just political participation in general. Like this is something that people don't think about very much people, especially who mostly are inundated by anti-communist propaganda here in the West is that the, the average person is was no more or less political there than here. Like the, the the capacity for us here to make meaningful political changes is not particularly great either. And when you dichotomize, you know, depends democracy where, where, versus where you're here. If you mean by sure, here, sure, like sure. the U.S., the U.S., then yeah, I would agree. Yeah, but <laughs> you know, like when you dichotomize democracy and autocracy, and you say, oh yeah, you know, the United States bastion of democracy soviet union bastion of autocracy you lose the nuance of well in the soviet sure. union the soviet citizen did participate in politics sometimes was even mandated to but at any rate was you know like the level of political participation is just as much a measurement of um you know democracy as um par- having parties and like multiple opinions in the upper tiers of leadership Socialism is when more democracy is when more parties, the more parties, the more democracy it is, even if only two of them ever win. Yeah. So that's my that's really like I wanted to get in because like, you know, a lot of people um, when they criticize the Soviet Union, they think of it as like totally politically calcified, that there was really nothing going on there other than, you know, the movements in the upper echelons. But the the reality is that there was a bottom up mobility and that some of even the worst chapters of Soviet history were fueled by bottom up activism, like the same as in the yeah. Cultural Revolution, you know, like the repressions in the 30s. There's a lot of motivated individuals on the ground being like, you know, what, screw that guy. He was a dick to me before the revolution, you know, like that kind of well, stuff. That, that's a whole other topic is like the Cultural Revolution, if anything, was like more anarchic, even though it yeah. had some bad ramifications. But it was a very much bottom up thing, but that's another topic. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I like mean regarding to. what you're saying, let's just get into great uh, red purges for a bit, because that's the thing that's contested a lot. Right. There's, you know, the, the people let's say like uh, hundreds of millions of people or whatever died. And then the more moderate estimates will say like as low as 700,000. Let's assume, let's give the benefit of the doubt, say 700,000 people were executed in the red purges. That's still a lot of fucking people. Yeah. I mean, like, le- le- like, didn't that damage the country? Or well, the, I think what socialism it, what it, rather. What it really hurt the most was, I mean, this this probably going to come out wrong, but more than anything, it the purges affected the intellectual integrity of the party because a lot of the people who were purged, one way or Bolsheviks. another, either executed or ex- estranged from politics, were Marxists. You know, maybe they were not party line Marxists, but in, in maybe maybe I'm thinking of this from the perspective of the 21st century where I'm like, my God, but, anyone but they were who... all they're all Trotskyist Nazi collaborators. What are you, you know, talking about? Right. It's, <laughs> it's crazy because like now I'm, I'm I'm desperate for as many Marxists and Marxist minded and, and, you know, communist people as we can get our hands on, really. Right. Like we shouldn't be 
estranging people, or let alone executing them, just because they don't agree with our interpretations of Marx. And that isn't, of course, why they were executed. It was more of a, just like a power struggle. But that's what, to me, in terms of the context of like what uh, contributed to the Soviet Union's political weakness, it was definitely that. Like how many people, uh, like uh, there, there's this guy, uh, Isaac Rubin, who kind of pioneered like the um, value form theory stuff that is popular among some Marxists now that um, he, I'm pretty sure, was also purged. I don't remember if he was executed or not, but he was certainly purged from the party. And like a lot of know, like, famous Bolsheviks are executed. Right. Like, I mean, Bukharin, it's just like a, Kamenev, loss, yeah. a loss of intellectual capacity. And especially when you know pretty much for sure that most of them were committed to Marxism and socialism and the building of something better than capitalism in one way or another, like that's, that's really what hurt the country the most. I mean, yeah. There's something I, I, I touch on. Cause you know, I, I was watching like a certain ML YouTuber who might've been quite popular back in the day. And they were trying to make the argument about like why the show trials, like they're trying to like argue the Stalinist perspective of the show trials and they were trying to say, see, they were part of the right opposition. It's like, okay, and that they, you know, whatever opposed like the Stalinist leadership. It's like, okay, sure. Even if that's true, like, is that a reason to fucking kill them? Like, what the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> like, what argument is that? Like, but there is like, I think a psychological logic underpinning this. Uh, and I'll, I'll call it, I'll just call it the Stalinist subject. There is a certain subject. And I remember I saw this interview with this old guy. It was, uh, I think you could probably find it on YouTube. It was about like, oh, he was interviewed about, it was a guy who likes Stalin, an old guy in Russia. And he said, he was asked, oh, do you like Stalin? And he said, yeah. And he said, didn't he kill a lot of people or whatever? You know, it's a liberal person interviewing. And the old guy responded saying, he didn't kill enough people. And oh yeah, said, I've seen that. And he yeah. said, why, why did you say that? And he's like, because, or something like, and he said, because Gorbachev was a kulak. And uh, no, Gor- no, he said, no, Gorbachev's father was a kulak mm-hmm. and Gorbachev ruined the Soviet Union. And it's like, what I mean is like, it sounds stupid, obviously, but this underpins a lot of like the, the I call it like jokingly the Stalinist logic, but it's really like the, just a totalitarian logic that a lot of people have sometimes is that the idea that you can get rid of a problem by just getting rid of it, <laughs> you know, like just getting rid of it out of existence by like killing the other. Uh, or it is can manifest in other ways too by like you know in a legalist form where oh let's say I don't like drugs I don't like prostitution make that shit illegal it's like or markets make that stuff illegal that doesn't necessarily get away with the that doesn't solve the problem like it still exists even though you're banning it in the same way if you kill off opposition you're not killing off the ideology that you're opposing you're just killing the people espousing it and the idea that because like believe it or not there is like a small faction of the left who really believes that like if stalin killed just enough people you would have avoided revisionism Mm -hmm. it sounds stupid to like the average sane person but that's like a serious argument i've heard you know the likes of like grover fur imply yeah i mean obviously grover fur for those don't know is probably like if you see anyone cite grover fur look with a bit of suspicion Encourage them to read something else, perhaps at least to compliment Any, the Grover. Yeah. Fur. Um, I, I mean, Grover, the, Fur, it's not like he makes stuff up, he just draws like completely weird conclusions yeah. from what he yeah. takes. Like, he'll read the Soviet archives and then he'll make like these connections, right? So, it's like it's like he's a bad arg- he's a bad rhetorician and a bad, like, bad at making arguments. And, but- and uh, <laughs> in, in, in Grover's Grover Fur's defense. There's a lot of historians <laughs> who do that, right? Like, oh, yeah, a, yeah, true. Like, that's basically the the MO of, like, you know, a lot of the right-wing Sovietologists as well. They'll yeah, take true. a piece of archival evidence and then extrapolate based on their belief of who Stalin was or who whoever was that, that the subtle implication of this specific letter means that Stalin was, like, you know, uh, like, was racist towards... Uh, Kazakhs or or Jews or Ukrainians or something like that, and there's like, oh, yeah, really? yeah, like or the the geo the whole yeah, like the idea, like let's say like the the famine happened disproportionately in Ukraine and and Kazakhstan, which people like like to ignore for whatever reason. 
but uh, they'll use that and they'll use, yeah, like you said, like some letter or something and say, therefore, he wanted to genocide Ukrainian nationalism. Right. I mean, I mean it's, yeah, a lot it's on of both a sides, priori, priori but it's just like a logic. bad argument. And I always expect yeah. more out of leftists, you know, like I expect Marxists who are like science supposed to be like scientific or whatever to like not make those arguments. But there is like there is like a small portion of the left who has like this fantasy that if you know, enough revisionists were killed. I mean, this is like a fantasy that I think Mao believed. I, 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 I think Mao and Hosha kind of believed this subtly. You know, that maybe. Decided, I mean, I, maybe not I kill them, but that's kind of what the cultural revolution was kind of about. Just maybe not killing people, but it was about like removing the revisionists in the party. I think that that's what a lot of uh, people within the apparatus used it for. But again, I, I will stress that a lot of these events were like socioeconomic explosions that were like the the energy that like the entropy or whatever that that created these situations were not like you know from Mao himself or from Stalin himself but people within the party were attempting to leverage this kind of like raw uh explosive social power to you know achieve specific ends specific political objectives yeah um, i think it's just easy to pin it on figures because of for sake of argument i guess so like i guess when, when i'd say when i say stalin i may say mao i mean i would say their orbit of influence like their their uh like them and their closest followers so when i would say what mao believed and what mao did i mean mao and his red guards sure. mao and lin piao right not just mao right there would be a bunch of figure a bunch of figures behind that as opposed to like you know one person and yeah there is like the socioeconomic factor but i mean sometimes it doesn't change whether it happens if that makes sense right because sort of you know the idea that okay for example stalin pur the red purges are sometimes justified by like anti-revisionist mls on the basis that he was getting rid of the bureaucracy mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and that's certainly one. Not. Obviously, that didn't work. Right. And second, that's just a really, really terrible way to go about that. Right. Yeah, I think that pretty much everyone who is coming to this, to this, to the complexities of, of this historical period with the intent to absolve um all of the problems of any sin and to you know essentially justify it in some way logically or otherwise even morally that's you're not going to come up with an analysis that is sufficiently rigorous that's that's really what the underlying issue is is that um you're kind of seeking a specific outcome from looking at this part of history instead of looking at it and attempting to assess you know bottom up top down and like all around like what exactly was going on um what specific people's objectives were and what different groups objectives were and yeah so that that is just often lost on on people and and i i'm not going to claim that like me or other uh less fervent marxists who maybe are not like you know pro purge don't have our own ideological inclinations and that that doesn't affect our analysis like this idea that there's an impartial scientist out there who can <laughs> conduct his work or her work in, in a way that is void of values like of course not but that that's where you get when when when, when well, i believe you can't be you can't be unbiased but you can be balanced that's right yeah you, you can you know yeah you should not come to especially these moments in history with sort of immediate conclusions based on your current political stance you know i mean it like regarding though just the killing off of bureaucrats to tie that into the fall of the soviet union i think it's important just to know because it just weakened the party integrity and and infrastructure you know the ability to have a generation of new ideas in the bolshevik party and also it created a very hostile atmosphere where people were completely afraid to you know voice different opinions and i know there's this like story that's told by liberals a lot but it's like it's, it's unfortunately true which is you know they 
the, the time where like when Stalin gave, gave like the speech and people were kept clapping and no one wanted to be the last clapping. Yeah. It's, it's like a meme, but like there's truth to it, you know, and that says a lot about like an environment where people are, are terrified to, to like voice opposition and what you just don't get like a vibrant, like, I mean, aren't Marxists supposed to be dialect, like dialectical right you know stalin literally wrote a book called dialectic which is garbage but that's just my, that's my bias the like dialectical uh material and historical materialism but like in its original idea dialectics is about grappling with contradiction right and to deal with to grapple with contradiction you have to grapple with dissent you know it doesn't mean you have to platform right-wingers like gorbachev did like leave uh the media to the penetration of western influence like uh, obviously you know gorbachev did right there's that extreme but you know that some liberalization was needed i know like it happened a little bit under khrushchev like a little bit but um like that's that weakened the country completely and when you have that uh like okay the bureaucracy was a problem from the start part of it was unavoidable right because you, you know there's the famous Lenin quote that after the after the revolution, or was after the civil war, I forgot what it was, but he said like after I think it was after the civil war, the majority a, a big portion of our workers were either dead or tired. Mm. So then you had to like hire a lot of like former czarist bureaucrats and like reform them. You had well, to I mean you had to create was... this huge bureaucracy with the NEP, right? So part of it was inevitable, but I think. By it doesn't help when you add to that situation by like killing off so many Bolsheviks and so many killing off so many Marxists, you just make that situation and soup a lot worse, right? And I think it ended up leading to like a worse bureaucracy later on, yeah. I mean, yeah, the question of the bureaucracy is also complicated. I mean, I think there are like ebbs and flows in the history of the party, I mean, like. For example, in the 30s, there was this massive drive to increase party membership and specifically with like quotas in mind for minorities and women so that the like, you know, it wasn't just dominated by, you know, pre-revolutionary educated men from like the Russian population. So there was like a lot of in affirmative action initiatives. I covered this like recently in my video on Kazakhstan about how like Soviet Union was very much like an affirmative action country. And there were moments where like the party expanded a lot. And then moments where they were like, oh, there's too many people like, you know, maybe too many opportunists. And we need to sort of like refine and sharpen down the numbers. And then so there's expulsions. And so like, you know, the, the bureaucracy in capital letters is difficult because it evolved over time. Its composition evolved over time. But for it me, became a fucking nightmare by the by the 1970s. Yeah. Like by the 1970s, like most of the bureaucrats didn't even believe in the system. Well, that's the thing is, you know, with the purges and the outcome of that, you who who survives that? Mostly people who are good at politics, like Machiavellian types, <laughs> right? Yeah. Those are the people. You, so you've purged your party of kind of like eccentric ideal hugs you know like people who just are committed to the theory but aren't really like politicians so you're left with politicians people who can maneuver the specific apparatus to you know either survive i mean that that's not to say that they have like no commitment at all to the idea but like those are the people who make it out of that environment of that chaos and of mm -hmm. course that kind of bureaucracy is not going to be primarily concerned with the interests of the countries and the people's survival. I mean, and this is the part of the big argument that, you know, like revisionism and opportunism was like the core factor in the downfall of the USSR. And the figure usually pointed to is Khrushchev. And I think there's some truth to that. Like, I think, yeah. you know, but the thing is, is it like what Stalin did didn't make that better. Like, whereas the, that's the thing, the anti-revisionists think it would have been fine if he just like didn't die and continued. Whereas like eliminating so much of the actual ideologues, like the actual people who, and I think Stalin himself was like a communist. I don't think he was like some sort oh, yeah. of revisionist of or whatever. Like, I think he was like a communist. It's just that his like 
insane like autocracy and uh and not just him but like the people around him like like uh molotov and also the institution of the nkvd which is just a terrible institution you know in terms of like a very like a, you, it's a it was a, a frankly, frankly one of the most extreme expressions of the deep state <laughs> uh the nkvd so you what what this and what this situation led to it didn't make opportunism any better what it, they ended up doing is just you know, killing off people who weren't seen as loyal to, you know, the particular agenda of, you know, Stalin's leadership. And what ended up, that didn't end up like removing the opportunism. What that just ended up doing is you had a bunch of people who kept like pretending to like lick Stalin and Molotov's ass and opportunists who would shift their opinions throughout the USSR. I mean, Khrushchev himself, like this is the whole irony of Khrushchev, right? Is you know, like, I think like some of the things he says, like in the secret speech, like some, a lot of that's true. Right. But the thing about Khrushchev, what's so ironic is he was like calling shots. He was like in charge of a lot of this shit. Like, you know, he has a ton of uh, blood on his hands and he was also head of, he was, I think general, what was he? He was in charge of the Ukraine basically during uh, the famine. I mean, he, he's totally an opportunist, but to what extent did like the purging, I think that made opportunism a lot worse. And I think you can bring this back to, to a certain extent, like this is endemic to one party states in general, even worse when you have like an oppressive one party state with no factions is what ends up happening is you don't get rid of opposition. The opposition just changes their clothes. They became like snakes and they, they shift their way into the party, right? It's like, did Stalin remove the opportunists? No, the opportunists just became Stalinists and then changed their position when he died. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, and that's the thing is that's the, uh, that's the shock that we all received, especially people who lived in that part of the world when the Soviet union did collapse, like one minute we have a communist party and the next minute they're all taking the country apart piece by piece, becoming oligarchs. Like, where did this come from? Where did, how how did they how did members of the communist party party suddenly become essentially like cap like hyper capitalists? That doesn't happen overnight. That doesn't happen just. There's no like change of heart that occurs instantly. So when you start to answer that question, is where you start to go back in history and realize like there is almost like a filtration process, right? Like the, I I again I'll stress that like there were moments in the party where there was very active incentives to grow the party membership, include people uh, of different perspectives and educate them. And um, like the whole indigenization policy of like making sure that people in the regional and different Republic parties were from those actual places. Like there were moments in the Soviet union where real attempts were made at uh, creating like political pluralism of a sense but by the end of it, it's clear that like that had not succeeded, that the people who were in charge of running the country essentially just like dissolved it, even though most people weren't particularly interested in that outcome. Obviously, we're running up on time a lot. And I think we're going to get into the Khrushchev period and central planning bureaucracy on part two on your part. But I want to kind of end part one on the idea, since it's very relevant to what we're talking about, about the democracy question in the USSR. And that is, was the USSR a democracy in a certain sense? Because, you know, I hear, I, I hate to boil it down to two senses, but like there is, you know, the narrative among most people, I would say, liberals, conservatives, and, you know, large, most Marxist, even most anarchists, USSR was not a democracy at all. Mm -hmm. Then you have on the ML side that there was a democracy. There was Soviet democracy. See, mm -hmm. there was elections, right? And there was a lot of the party membership was workers, even more so under Stalin, actually. Uh, a large percentage of the party was workers. Right. You have uh, the, the book, I, ML's like this side is the uh, Soviet democracy by P uh, Pat Sloan. Sure. And, you know, I have my biases. I'll, I'll share them first, but I want to get your opinion on whether, whether you think the Soviet Union was a democracy. Well, you know, let, let me. Uh, it doesn't. I, I'm not expecting you to be binary, but yeah, like, yeah. you know, it's obviously multifaceted. I, I am going to explicitly reject the binary and, and say that uh, 
Well, I'm, I'm going to question what it means to be a democracy because that's such a like uh, ideological club used by Uncle Sam to beat everyone over the head with. And what how we define it does matter. If we mean by democracy the capacity for the people of a country or region or whatever to dictate politics and the outcome of pol political policies on life itself and pe for the life of the people, and whatever degree of that is that occurs is the degree of democracy, you know, like rule of the people, then there was a considerable amount of that in different periods in the Soviet Union on different levels, sometimes very localized, sometimes more regional. Like to say that, you know, there was this complete separation between the party leadership and everyone else is definitely not correct. You know, like, um, Yes, there was no opposition party, and eventually there was a purging of all factions. So there was like a single line, more or less, with like maybe differing interpretations of it. Um, but that doesn't mean that there were not ordinary people who did not get elected on the factory floor to, you know, make changes in their policies. Like there's like famous cases of like, you know, like the tractor woman, I forgot her name, who like developed like new ways of cultivating agricultural crops and basically was elected to her local leadership and then eventually regional and even to the Supreme Soviet. So like there was uh, political participation. For me, that's how I measure it. And when you measure it that way, then things in the world just become a lot more gray. Like the Soviet Union was obviously not a completely politically free country. There was a lot of political limitations and pretty much anyone you ask who lived there will definitely agree with that. But in that sense, like, you know, the countries that we consider really democratic, uh, they're, they're, they're not so much just because they have like, you know, 20 different parties competing in the elections. Like that doesn't really say anything about the degree to which a person can influence their like immediate life through some kind of participation, you know? So that's my answer. That's right. the answer I tend to give. I think I think there's multiple ways to measure democracy, but I, I would I would maybe add there's like th maybe three factors I consider important to democracy. One is participation, obviously. The second would be the ability to, I would say, choice. So the ability to influence alternative policies, alternative mm. visions, alternative maybe even ideologies or just visions of the the trajectory of the government. And I think the third would be political expression. So that'd be civil liberties. Because I, I think liberty and democracy are almost separate. And I hate the way liberals bastardize the term liber liberty because for liberals, it's often limited to like economic liberty, mm -hmm. uh, negative liberty, the ability to you know participate as a market actor to own private property, et cetera. But you know, liberty is much bigger. It's about the also like free speech is very important to uh to liberty and i think in the freedom of expression freedom of religion etc there's a lot of things that go into liberty if you, so if you look at these three factors when it comes to participation i would actually agree with you i would say the soviet union was in terms of participation maybe more democratic than the united states or like a westminster liberal democracy like canada well, especially if you think but, like pre like civil rights in the United States. <laughs> well, yeah, but even now, you know, even in terms now, of yeah. choice, it was obviously uh, less, but not as much as people think, <laughs> especially in the United States, because in, in the Soviet Union, at the end of the day, you could participate in the government probably a lot more easier than you can yeah. in the, way more easier than yeah. in the United States. And I would say, you know, Cuba is definitely way better on this ground than the Soviet Union is in the sense that in Cuba, you can like run as an independent, you can like a big portion of the uh, Congress is in the, is uh, workers. There's a strong, like in so much so that Raul Castro's vision of marketization in the uh, 2000s was rejected by, mm -hmm. you know, by the workers in the, in the Cuban party. A Cuban Communist Party. So, like, there is a participation. There is, but here's the reality, right? Is like you have one party. So there's yeah. not not even like there there might be oppositions within the party. Maybe more so in Cuba. I'm not, I'm less familiar with like the different factions in the Cur Cuban Communist Party. So I, I would I'm not so sure about that. But at least in Russia, definitely under uh, sorry in the Soviet Union, especially under Stalin, uh, 
you there wasn't like you know you could you could maybe participate in the party but if if you were part of like the left opposition we saw what happened to the left opposition or the right sorry the right opposition you know and and the left opposition so like you know with the the left opposition being like trotsky right opposition being bukharin you pretty much they got liquidated you know so there, there wasn't very much choice. Not, like, it's not just the party. Obviously, there wasn't really like <laughs> other parties uh, w- with any real ability to influence. And really until Gorbachev, you know, allowed other parties. But even like at the very least, you would expect like within the party there to be like factions. But even that was highly restricted uh, in the Soviet Union, especially, especially under Stalin, right? You know, things changed a little bit under Khrushchev. But... So in that regard, in terms of choice, in terms of real ability to change the trajectory of the government, really not there. Also, the way Soviet policies were passed was was kind of like, was it really democratic? Like, so people had the ability to you know join the party fairly easily to participate in local elections, but often policies were passed top down from the CPSU, from the Central Committee. And a lot of policies were in like a big package and, you know, the people voting on it, there's a, it's hard to tell to what extent, whether like it was symbolic, you know, like the Soviet democracy just became a symbolic thing rather than real democratic centralism. I kind of am the, of the opinion that more so the democracy was pretty much a sham, uh, even though there was some participation, but it was a sham in the sense that like, did they really have the ability to sway uh the trajectory yes. definitely not under stalin and less not much under brezhnev either um and now the third thing in terms of liberty you know obviously this changed a lot during the soviet union but i think this was pretty bad uh like the ussr had pretty terrible free speech laws um also the problem with like the criminal court system was that like if there you were you could be accused of something that there wasn't a a law against and you could be prosecuted on that on the grounds of quote-unquote revolutionary justice um that's just really problematic okay because the problem is is i like i hate to sound like a lib (laughs) but we do there needs to be like a bit of checks and balances in a system or else like it's so easy for the dominant party to shift laws to justify whatever it wants. So right. like on the, in that grounds, I, I think the USSR was deeply undemocratic. Now, obviously I agree with you fully in the sense that this doesn't mean like the West, especially, especially not the United States was like some pinnacle of democracy, which is why I really hate the idea of, Oh, democracy versus totalitarianism. Right. Like I'm very, you know, also being, you know, in, in political science, I'm very, very averse to this idea. Very, very, it really pisses me off. It's actually part of what my project is, you know, like politically is, uh, I don't think that it's such a false dichotomy, but I don't, I, just, I also don't like the what aboutism that a lot of, you know, the, especially the MLs do where it's like, Oh, it's not true. It was no democracy. They had Soviet democracy. See? Mm-hmm. And, you know, like Pat Sloan's book, Soviet Democracy, it outlines like the structure of like, you know, the council of ministers, the local elections and whatnot, but it doesn't actually really highlight how this was in practice. And in practice, the people who are elected in local elections did not have a significant ability to really deviate from the party line. And much of like what the agenda was, was passed top down. And my position on this isn't to say like, oh, you know, what would have been better. And this is, you know, even the social Democrats are guilty of this is, you know, I, I don't believe in the idea that, oh, what would have been better is if the USSR just had more parties, that would have solved the problem. It's like, no, it's a lot deeper than that. It's a big part of it. It's like the liberties, the tolerance of factions, you know, legal, le- the legality of so, so much of that, uh, you know, they sh- whether there's different parties, I'm not necessarily against different parties, but I don't think that solves the problem. Democracy is a lot bigger than that. Yeah. Like you said, it, participation is probably the most important factor in democracy, but I highly doubt the extent whether participation was that meaningful in the Soviet Union, like meaning, meaningful as in that whether it really had an effect. And that's kind of what the, you know, uh, 
uh, their argument that, oh, yes, they did have democracy. I think it leaves out. But it, like, I think we agree on mainly the fact that it isn't a false binary, right? It's not whether they were completely totalitarian or completely or, or, or democratic. But what I would say is the Soviet Union's political system is not one I would replicate. And it might come to some surprise of people that I actually would consider myself like a democratic centralist. Like I believe in some form of democratic centralism, just in a form that takes is wildly different and wildly more liberal than what existed in the Soviet Union. You know, and I think there's some efforts to improve that. I don't, I don't think Cuba is perfect. I think Cuba is still too bureaucratic and the party has too much power, but I think Cuba in terms of participation, it has integrated itself a lot better than Soviet Union did. So I think there's progress there, right? So yeah. that'd be my take on that. Yeah, I mean, and that's, I, I also want to add, you know, like when we talk about the political structure, obviously what's important is not, you know, like, oh, you get the democracy badge or you get the autocracy badge. It's it's that, um, how did the political structure affect the outcome for the Soviet Union? Because that's totally, to me, like, you know, that's what matters when we talk about the politics of the Soviet Union. I think that most of Soviet achievement is not in the realm of like political innovation, obviously. It, it's it's really more about what they're able to achieve like socially and if, even yeah. scientifically. But in the, in the context of like, you know, why do we care about the Soviet political system? It's really just to understand why the limitations of that system uh, created the conditions for its ultimate demise. Not necessarily like to me, like the the, the exercise of like, you know, is it a democracy? Oh, I think it led is it to autocracy is, is you know that's that's the goal of it. Is to well, I do understand. I do think I do think lack of democracy did play a role in its demise because you know, and there's different there, even some MLs admit this. Like you know, like Hakim is a the YouTuber. He's a ML. He and he, he has a video where he says like lack of democratic participation played a role in like the fall of Soviet Union. And I think it's true because like if there was, it, I think a lot of, if there was more meaningful democratic participation and tolerance of different thought and factions, you wouldn't have this rush to like adopt a liberal system like what Gorbachev ended up doing. Mm -hmm. Because the problem was, is the Soviet Union was so pretty undemocratic for so long that when Gorbachev took the liberal approach and like opened the Soviet Union up so much to the point where it made itself vulnerable to like Western penetration and influence, as well as like literally platforming right wingers, they just weren't ready for that. You know, like it was too big of a jump. So I think they could have avoided this. No one would have fell for this idea either. Like, I don't think people would have fell for like live the, the idea of like liberal style democracy if there was an actual soviet democracy i know that was the goal but i don't think it was really ever like achieved due to like intolerance of different opinions and i say that not only under stalin even though it was his most extreme but like you know the conservative turn under brezhnev that that really to foreshadow what we'll talk about on your channel I think, you know, projects like, um, was it called OGAS? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the cybernetic, the project basically to build a sort of proto-internet. I think that might have been possible if there was actually like more openness to the system and less rigidity. Whereas because of this fear of any information getting out that would hurt the party propaganda, this completely like really created like a very undynamic system a lack of dynamism and that's why i think you, you need more democracy like, demo like the, democracy is good for socialism right and that's from my, my view of democratic socialism is more in the realm of like meaningful participation and discourse as opposed to merely like different parties because right here you can have different parties and what if they can't win right like it doesn't mean anything or what if you have participation but you can't criticize the party line I think that's stupid. So, yeah, I don't know if that was well articulated. No, I, I agree. I think, I mean, we could probably 
you know, hash out more about, um, you know, this, the, the, the absence of sig- sufficient political mobility and freedom in this, in the Soviet union. But, you know, there, that, that's just, that's a theme, you know, that that's something that persists throughout its entire history one way or another to varying degrees. Um, so maybe it's something that we could like return to once Perhaps. we cover like the next, you know, the next eras, I guess. I guess, you know, what I would say is there's two things that are really crucial here is um, one, not all like actually existing socialist countries like were the same, obviously, but yeah. there's a principle I go by is like, if you're not allowed to leave the country or visit the country without a guided tour, it's not democratic. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's just not a free society. Like there's no way to like go around that, in my opinion. Because like there's if you have something that big to hide, it's obviously if there's something big to hide, right? And you know, I've I've been to Cuba twice, and my impression of Cuba was, you know, it's not like it's not a perfect democracy at all by any means. It's you know, I don't think democracy has really been perfected anywhere, and it ha- it's kind of restrictive in some ways. But it was did not feel like a totalitarian society. Like I was able to like go, you know, through Havana and stuff, and you're able to. There, there's like a level of freedom that just isn't there in North Korea. Like North Korea, you have it's really hard to even visit. You have to, you have like a saint, a state sanctioned tour, and uh, you can't leave the country. <laughs> you you if you try to escape the country, you get shot. And let's not forget, like East Germany had a system like this. USSR under Stalin had a system like this. Romania under Ceausescu had a system like this. And I I I think like that's just indefensible. You know, and some people will kind of like try to defend that because there's some there's a tendency among like newly radicalized leftists where they'll realize that a lot of what's said about actually existing socialism, quote unquote, is is like fabricated or exaggerated. Mm-hmm. They'll think it's all made up. Yeah, you know, they'll think it's that's all where, made up. That's and where that, a lot that, of this that, comes from. Yeah, yeah. And yeah that, it's and just I'm really like to caution like my audience against that because I. I've seen people like go from, oh, you know, whatever, like it's really young, impressionable people are susceptible to this type of thinking, you know, where, and I think they'll make an ass of themselves if they like talk to anyone else and try to persuade them onto socialism. If you have a conversation with someone and you say like, oh, like, well, like, no, North Korea is actually this, like uh, uh, Canada is just as undemocratic as North Korea. And just make an ass out of yourself, like with most people, you know, and people fall, fall prey to that mainly because we're fed with so many lives, lies ourselves, yeah. like in our countries, that people will believe the exact opposite. And that's almost what actually happened in some of these like socialist countries is in these countries, like, for example, I, I would be curious, actually, what your dad's experience was, because you kind of alluded to it, is I know Michael Parenti talks about this in chapter four of Black Shirts and Reds, is that because the state media was so biased, you know, to like either obfuscating realities of the West, not talking about the West or talking about how terrible it was and talking about how great their country was. A lot of people just stopped believing the media, you know, like people just didn't believe in the media to the point where even when people in the media said something true, like yeah. about exploitation or whatever, people wouldn't believe it. And then people ended up fantasizing in their heads about like this Western consumer utopia. And like, that's what drove a lot of like uh, the embrace of uh, leaving the Soviet Union and its ultimate demise. So I guess what I would say is you can't complete, you can never fully like repress things, (laughs) if that makes sense. They'll, they'll, you have to like deal with contradiction and that's part of dialectics. You can't uh, remove contradiction. Yeah. It's just, you know, it's difficult. It's a difficult um line to toe because uh one thing that i always know is these like the the repressive elements in places like the soviet union are very historically contextualized like the reason that it became the way that it did and the reason north korea is the way it is i mean a lot of it was you know uh the product of extreme pressures external pressures and internal pressures and uh, 
Um, that's that's how we got to that point with those countries. But um, I think that it's it, it's a difficult line to toe between, uh, you know, repression is not going to fix some of the underlying um, concerns that people have. Uh, at the same time, you know, like you were saying, you can't go full like Gorbachev and sort of just allow um, uh, or actually maybe another example might be like Allende's Chile, you know, where. Yeah, um, I like to bring that up a lot. You know, you don't you don't fight back at all. And you just kind of you're like, oh, you know, like we're not going to repress anyone. Like we're not going to like uh, we're just going to let the, the truth sit, you know, speak for itself. And the capitalists will use every possible tool and they've got more than we do at their disposal to destroy everything that you try to build. You might not even get to build it at all. So this it's just like it's a, a really difficult question, you know, like to what degree do you uh, protect yourself from those kind of incursions? Because they will happen. And to what degree that just becomes sort of senseless repression that has the exact opposite of the intended effect. Yeah, I mean, that's that's very important because. I mean, uh, this is why I don't like the authoritarian versus libertarian distinction, because yeah. I think any sort of state that's in a moment of revolutionary siege, where there's like a huge opposition undermining its success, there is an inevitable degree of authoritarianism. I mean, Lenin is famous in State and Revolution for saying, as long as the state exists, there is no like full freedom. Sure. Uh, no freedom can exist. Full freedom can't exist with as long as there's the state, right? And yeah, I mean, that's that's true. <laughs> I think what one can prevent, though, is like a totalitarianism, which I think I see is, is a fully totalizing type of control where dissent is completely permitted. And uh, I think obviously the USSR, East Germany, North Korea, they did this with hard power. But, you know, there's some people like Herbert Marcuse, who I'm a big reader of, who argues that the US, the United States is authoritarian, but a totalitarian oh, in yeah. a soft power way. And it's Meaning far like, more sophisticated, you yeah. know, it's a, it's a much more sophisticated type of control. Um, is it, was it Deleuze that talks about like societies of control or yeah, something that's like Deleuze. that? Yeah. Yeah. So I have a whole and, video about that. That's kind of about a bunch of these theories. Yeah. Yeah. Not society. Right. I, I remember that was a great video. I remember watching that some time ago, but, um, that, that's something I've thought about a lot too, is like part of the reason I think the Soviet Union was not like both America and the Soviet Union had extensive propaganda machines in the Cold War. Uh, and, and of course, as a Marxist, I think the Soviet Union's pro-worker, anti-capitalist propaganda was justified in principle, but the way that it went about it was very crude compared to like the way that information oh, is they controlled up in lying. capitalism. Like the, the, I've seen, like I've seen some of like the old like Stalin era propaganda, and some of it's it's kind of funny. Yeah, but <laughs> like, you know, like they're, 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 they 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 like they took pictures of the Great Depression and tried to make it seem like that was always happening, right? You know, kind of like actually the way that you know the the most extreme Jordan Peterson types like to make it seem that USSR was always having famines, like socialisms when no food. Yeah, and I think, but I don't. Here's the thing: I think the far right propaganda, like none of that, any kind of totalizing totalitarian propaganda, it doesn't work for very long because I think, in the same way, in the West, because of some of the more more exaggerated forms of propaganda about socialism is when no food, hundred billion trillion. I think that's what's causing the rise of like the other, like the people who are like you know, Daddy Stalin did nothing wrong. Mm. or look how based kim jong-un is and it's kind mm. of like a it's a cultural reaction to like a failing propaganda like yeah, any kind it's... of sophisticated hegemony so any sophisticated hegemony can't obfuscate contradiction too much or else people just intuitively it really is sense. more about like when you when you have like you know the kim jong-un you know has a lot of drip type of thing you know like where people <laughs> like are super into it i don't know sometimes i definitely think it's ironic but even when some it's people serious, it's ir a lot of people it's ironic but like it, some people like there's some people who who youtube channels are pictures of stalin right i mean i think i think it's just it's 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 more about uh a reaction to like a knee-jerk reaction to the west and its propaganda and what it stands for 
then it really is about an endorsement of, you know, specific forms of that's what I like uh, to believe. But then I see people cite Grover Fur. I still then, think I still think a lot of that comes down to um that initial moment of rejection of like, oh, I a lot of, if not everything that I've been told is a lie. So, you know, I the the best way I can rebel against this massive deceit that has been uh part of my lived experience is to go in the exact opposite direction, you know. Yeah. And I mean, I that's the thing, I kind of understand where it comes from, but where I would say is like it's just it's not a good way to go about like building a socialist movement. Because no. the reality is, especially if one is in it really depends where one is, right? Where one lives, because especially if one lives in the United States, Canada, or Britain, where there's like a large degree of like Eastern European immigration, try talking like that with a person whose parents are born in Eastern Europe. It's not going to go very well, you know, and like there's a lot because it's a lot of people who grew up in these areas might like some of them might be brainwashed. Like it's true. But like there is like there is like, for example, like I, I have a relative who grew up in East Germany and. You know, the, it's not like it, all this shit's made up. Right. So if, if newly radicalized people come bring that rhetoric where it's like I've seen YouTubers make like a whole series on the GDR and how great it was. Like in how, you know, all its great things and obfuscating like the fucking fact that you couldn't leave. Um, and that, like, the, it's a serious thing. It's not just like lunatics online with like hammers and whatever. It's not just lunatics. Like there is like a tendency. I don't think it's a problem to the point where I, that's why I don't use the whole term tanky. But there is like a type of one dimensional thinking that can arise in response to another form of one dimensional thinking. Yeah. And that's just not like going to work very well. You know, it's just yeah. too, it's I mean, too, e it's too easy for like, that's the thing. And I hate it because it pollutes Marxism. A lot of people think Marxism is some sort of endorsement of like everything associated with Marxism. I, I think it's, um, it's probably important to just keep reading. You know, I think a lot of these situations, it's just, there hasn't been enough time spent yet sort of exploring the history and the theory. And um, it just sort of takes time to come into different information and perspectives. And, um, you know, initially you might just read Grover Fur, So your opinion is going to be very particular. A lot of them don't read Soviet Grover Union. Fur. They'll watch somebody who read Grover Fur. Yeah, exactly. It's very <laughs> diluted information that you pick up from like the internet and, I think that in most I, when I cases, say this, I'm more referring to like people who because the things I can understand, like the impressionable teenagers, like I don't really blame them, but it's more like the people who will go out and make like propagate narratives and they'll mm -hmm. kind of dis, they'll mislead a whole new generation of leftists. Well, that's different, too. That is uh, an individual who has found a specific niche. And I think we're all somewhat disposed to spiraling into uh, like, you know, tunnel vision. And it takes effort to not do that. And I think that for the people who are, you know, very one dimensional in their presentation, and then that is sort of consumed by people who are watching them. I think it's it is about like, oh, you know, like I found like this the space where I can communicate the things that I have learned right. and I have no incentive to really like go do other types of reading or learning, which is partially a problem of the platforms that we are on. That's also. true. Yeah. I mean, and there is like, there is sometimes willful ignorance because, you know, there's a lot of people who will cite Parenti who, well, you know, I love Michael Parenti. Uh, people will cite him but then it completely ignore chapter four of black shirts and reds, mm. you know, which is a big part of that chapter deals with the failures of planning in the USSR. And mm. some people like to act like the economic calculation problem wasn't a thing. Mm. And I think you can make an argument against the economic calculation problem saying like, hypothetically, you know, it's talking about like cybernetics and the ability of computers to process big, much bigger amounts of data data for sophisticated plans mm. 
there's an argument against that, but like, was it a real thing back then? Undeniably, dude. Yeah, with the like, limitations I know, I, that they But there's had, people who course. did, but a lot of people like pretend this isn't the case because there is like, there's this argument I've heard made. It's like, oh, see, Soviet Union, people were fed more. They had a bigger caloric intake. Which refutes, mm. which obviously refutes the like no food bullshit argument, <laughs> and and they'll use that to say like, oh, see, like you know, it worked, but like it, that obfuscates reality that people waited in line for potatoes, you know, for well, like, that was a, a long random, time. But... Well, like there's like the huge lines, also a huge black market that at one point the Soviet Union literally let happen because it was more efficient than the planning system. I mean, we can yeah, talk about that. I mean, we'll talk. We'll talk about that in in part two. That's a good segue. And in part two, we're going to talk about Khrushchev, Brezhnev, and Gorbachev, and you know the economic problems concerning the USSR and central planning, and possibly the alternatives. You know, like OGAS. How could cybernetics have changed this? What could you know have prevented this? What were the causes? Blah blah blah. We'll get straight into that. Because I think that's a very interesting thing. And also a lot of the, you know, shortages manifested most acutely in the 1980s. Yes. During the yeah. economic stagnation, that's when like things got really bad. So without further ado, you've been listening to One Dime Radio, part one of the fall of the Soviet Union with the Marxist Project. If you enjoyed, support the channel and podcast on Patreon and go head right to the Marxist Project for part two.